Welcome everyone. This episode of The Drive is a little delayed because I was out of town traveling. But, um, some exciting news. Uh, my book was finally published uh, about the Sharp Method. We'll go into that. Also, um, <clears throat> I, uh, what to us is the, you know, a very important paper uh, was published and I uh, want to give a lot of a credit uh, to Craig Tipton and Nicole Diaz and Kyle Landry for helping me get this paper published. It looks at um, almost 700 consecutive samples about biofilm and the bacteria involved in the biofilm production. So let's let's dive into you know what was an incredibly uh, a busy time for me. <laughs> Uh, over the past uh, couple weeks. So, first of all, we've been uh, getting the the book uh, over the finish line, and if you haven't, you know, written a book or published a book, um, it can be arduous. I had contributed to books um, for different reasons over my academic career. <laughs> And I had uh, published manuscripts before, but I had not uh, published my own book. Now it's up, sharp. You can get it on Amazon, and uh, you can listen to it on Audibles. It'll be on iBooks. You can go to our store and buy it. Uh, but so it highlights, you know, fundamentally what we think is going on. So we'll summarize, you know, what has been. Uh, you know, a, a busy period of time of travel and, and getting these uh, publications up and, and running so that you can learn from them. So I always discuss breast implant illness as a chronic inflammatory process of which a breast implant, this medical device, a breast implant, is just one component. And if you think of it with that lens it'll make more sense. Now we published this paper to show what microorganisms what bacteria what what can be on the implant surface up against the scar tissue and interacting with the scar tissue and stuck against the scar tissue that the patient produces around the implant. So think of it, I always use this analogy of an easter egg so in Easter egg, at the time of Easter, you have those plastic eggs, but the candy inside. So we'll say the candy is the implant and the wrapper on the candy could be bacteria. So it can touch the inside of that shell. But if the shell is not completely sealed, uh, meaning your scar capsule has a leak, or if it's just not woven very tightly because you didn't lay enough uh, thick scar tissue down, that can interact with the breast tissue. And so in our series, we know it about, specifically in this series of almost 700 samples, 29% had bacteria. But at any given time, when you looked at an audit of my series, because I've done so many, several thousand now, it'll be close to a third. So we're just gonna use a third. A third of the time, we're gonna find a bacterial contaminant using quantitative PCR analysis. So PCR analysis looks specifically for DNA fragments. If you remember from the pandemic, you could get an antigen test or a PCR test. The PCR test is more accurate. It lets you know if the DNA fragment is there. So the DNA fragment in this instance is one of which a panelist looked at. It looks at 150 different types of bacteria, fungi, and mycobacteria. So what's important is, in our series, there's two dominant species of bacteria, and one's called Cutibacterium acnes, yes, acne, it's found in acne. And two is Staph epidermidis, which is found on the skin. So it's roughly a third. This is the largest study published in the world to date to show the incidence of bacterial biofilm of those patients who present with quote-unquote breast implant illness. So that's done and dusted. That's what it is. 
Now, another paper published this year shows that the interaction between those bacteria, specifically bacteria like Staph epidermidis, which produce biofilm, and Cutibacterium, which does produce, readily produce biofilm, those bacteria in their communities of bacteria, the biofilm, will interact with the breast tissue and specifically an oleic fatty acid in the breast tissue. Once this happens, it produces oxylipin. So it's oxidizing and creating this uh, oxylipin, which is called tinhome. Now this can go on to affect your immune system. And, and basically, the stimulation of the immune system can lead to more symptoms. I, I'm not gonna go into every specific component uh, it's a little too detailed and nuanced for this. I will produce another video and I'll voice over and show the paper and discuss it in more detail. But so oxylipin tinhome is just one molecule. There are other oxylipins that can be involved and elevated in patients with breast implant illness. So now for the first time we have the specific incidents from the paper we published of about a third, we'll just use that number. A third of the people can have this bacterial component. And then you're gonna you know, ask, well, other people that I've taken care of in my practice who that I've operated on did not have this bacterial component. So why are they having so many issues? And so this is really why I published the book Sharp. I reverse engineered this by, through the pandemic, just doing more and more work on our own because obviously there were a lot of limitations of what we could do in terms of referring patients out to see a functional nutritionist or uh, any kind of providers because people couldn't see people in person and I was considered at that point non-essential so I wasn't able to see patients and operate on patients so that being said the SHARP program really looks at your genetics. So that's fundamentally how you detox and metabolize based on your genetics. Looking at vitamin D synthesis, methylation pathways, utilization of glutathione, and antioxidant pathways coupled to hormone metabolism. So using that in conjunction with a toxicity test where the toxicity test looks for things like um, and, and you need to get these things in your vocabulary, so listen carefully. Environmental toxins that we're looking at can be from molds, so those are called mycotoxins. And so there's aflatoxins, fumicins, there's ochratoxin, there's all sorts of mycotoxins. After that, you know, we can look at and evaluate for heavy metals. And heavy metals can include tin and cadmium and lead and um, you know aluminum all sorts of things other environmental toxins are are just a whole wide variety but I'm gonna uh, name some of the basic ones so parabens parabens can be found in female products for skin care and or feminine hygiene glyphosates are what are herbicides and pesticides can be sprayed on foods and that contributes to increased glyphosates those are just a couple uh, there can be just a wide variety of chemicals like isopeteric uh, acid I, I mean I've seen triclos and all sorts of strange things in high high concentrations in patients from all over the United States and the world for that matter so once you have, like I said, genetics, we use Envision Labs for genetics, the toxicity test, then we look at gut health. And we've used different vendors. Uh, uh, suffice to say, we're gonna look at an analysis of the stool and we're trying to see, is there a parasitic overgrowth, fungal overgrowth, is there bacterial imbalance, is there H. pylori? Add a food sensitivity test to look at food triggers we look at hormones to see what's out of balance. Total testosterone, free testosterone, thyroid function tests. We're looking for estrogen imbalances, high estrone counts, 
people who are estrogen dominant will have higher than normal amounts of estrone. High amounts of estrone can lead to problems with the cycle, uh, difficulty with pain, excessive bleeding, endometriosis, polycystic ovarian syndrome. And there are, there are avenues to, to support this uh, holistically through supplementation of things like chrysin. So, and the final thing that we are striving and, and always looking for testing to help us clarify what's going on from an inflammatory standpoint is metabolomics. Metabolomics is looking at um, certain um, chemical reactions and measuring their products in a blood spot test. So those tests provide a lot of clarity about what each person is experiencing. <clears throat> and with that, we formulate a detoxification plan. So there's this thing called, you know, basically discussed, it's called bio-individuality. So I'm different and, and you're different. All of our listeners uh, are different. So each of these tests is going to be different and we're going to go back to it to help you improve and heal over time so <clears throat> sorry about my voice today so that's really what sharp is about the the other things that i feel were important to put in the book is not just embracing and understanding your bio individuality and your genetics and all the the different aspects of it but how to measure and, and really help yourself by the quality of sleep you get, food you put into your system, air quality, and fluid quality. So all these things, you know, I think um, anybody who listens to my podcast or our YouTube channel, you've heard me discuss air quality. I do it a lot. Uh, we currently use jasper.co in my office and recommend it to our patients. So that'll help improve your air quality. To fluid quality, um, in my office we use Echo to filter water and produce hydrogen water. So filtered water is the, is the minimum. Um, we add hydrogen uh, back. Hydrogen water can help reduce oxidation in the gut. Um, quality of food is probably the hardest thing you're going to find. Um, as a society, we've got very used to eating out or eating fast food and or processed foods or things that can be reheated. Um, reheating foods in plastic is a terrible idea. Eating processed foods is incredibly, um, from a nutritional standpoint, uh, poor for you. It also has a lot of preservatives and the reason it can stay on a shelf for a long time is it has sugar in it. So we want to reduce refined sugars, eliminate processed foods and preservatives out of the diet. Um, and I don't support any specific diet other than I want a high protein diet. So there's ways to get protein, animal plant-based protein. I, I don't, that's not a fight I'm interested in. Um, I'm interested in elevating the quality and quantity of protein in your diet and reducing your inflammation. So that's what's most important to me. Eating um, quality, organic, uh, really flincher fruits and vegetables, those are important. Um, eating healthy fats, so um, you have to be careful with how you source uh, nuts and how you source uh, your avocados so that they're um, and cleanse them properly of course so how, how does that all translate into what I said regarding um, quality of sleep we'll end on sleep so I measure this uh, sleep two ways using the ultra human ring and the whoop strap and um, I've had a whoop strap since 2016 I've had an ultra human ring a little over a year now and the reason I, I like the ultra human ring over other rings on the market is I've compared it to the whoop strap which I feel is currently the most uh, accurate 
So we're looking at HRV, heart rate variability, to establish how you're recovering. So um, I recently had a patient come to the office and say, you know, their HRV was in the teens. And so that's really poor. So if that's the case, that means you're unable to, you know, recover. So let's talk about some strategies to recover um, just on a daily basis, uh, separate from uh, surgery. So we try to follow the three, two, one rule. So stop eating about three hours before bedtime. Then you wanna have your last, you know, large amount of fluid and take about two hours before bedtime. And the reason being is a lot of people wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and that can be directly correlated to the fact that they were not able to go to the bathroom before they got off the bed or the volume of fluid they drank, like you had a big glass of water or something right before you went to bed or you drank a bunch of tea or you had a glass of wine or whatever. Whatever the you know issue is, we have to time it up better. We have to be smarter than that. So I'm encouraging you to follow this and see if it works for you. So stop eating about three hours before bed, stop drinking about two hours before bed. And then the hour before you're going to go to bed, cool off the room you're going to sleep in if that's your bedroom, cool it off so that it's, it's slightly cooler than the ambient temperature in the rest of the house. Make sure that it's not got a lot of uh, uh, bright lights on, dim the lights, <clears throat> and then, you know, if you need noise to sleep, you know, set up sleep noise. If you need a sleep mask, get a sleep mask organized. Then you can go back out. And if you have a lot of difficulty getting off to sleep, then I want you just really to get off your screens entirely one hour before you're going to bed. And if it's still difficult to get off to sleep, I have kind of a sleep hack. I use a combination of our magnesium, which is bisglycinate, and our calming sleep support, and melatonin SRT. So I can do one of each of those, or I can do two of each of those. And I just take those with a little like Dixie cup full of water, or a shot glass full of water, or a small amount of water, and then I go to sleep. Now, the other thing is if you snore, you need to get checked for sleep apnea because the last thing you want to do is not be able to sleep and get uh, recovered because you have sleep apnea. That's an easy fix. There's a company called ResMed that will actually send you the test and you can do it at home and then have a telemedicine visit. So that's how I want you to go ahead to start to improve your recovery by improving your HRV, by improving your sleep. So the quality of the food, quality of the air, quality of the fluid you take in, the timing of it. And remember, every, every second counts and everything you put into your body is important.